Okay, I think we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just we'll just wait um, for another minute or so until we get to half past, just to make sure we've got everyone who's planning to attend has, has joined the webinar properly. Should have got um, some sort of Tony Hart gallery music, I think, for. I'm waiting for people I to should have asked. I should have asked you to put the radio on or something, Caroline. <laughs> Play them or something. So, right, we've got we've got to half past, so we will we will make a start. And if anyone's going to join, they'll um they can just join in as we're as we're moving along. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled "Managing Well or Just About Managing." Uh, so, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, a copy of this will be available for everybody afterwards. And the webinar is designed to look in a, a bit more detail at the accidental manager, so a term which has become increasingly common over the last few years. And to, to start with a quote, um, by the end of 2019, even before the pandemic hit, the Chartered Management Institute estimated that the UK had over 2.4 million accidental managers in the workforce. So clearly a relevant topic for lots of people at the moment. Um, now we'll do proper introductions in just a moment um, and I'll also introduce my co-hosts who you can see on screen, Ben and Caroline for today. Uh, Ben's multitasking and driving the, the presentation so hopefully he's not too flustered. He's got a pretty decent poker face on at the moment um, and we also have Luke uh, who's kindly supporting us from a technical perspective. He'll be adding in some polls to the chat uh, function a bit later on and monitoring any questions that come in. However, before we do that, I just wanted to run through today's agenda and outline what we're trying to achieve. So all being well, this fits with what everyone was expecting to see today. And I guess if it doesn't, you've got the opportunity to leave before we start. <laughs> Hopefully that won't be the case for anyone. So following um, our introductions, uh, the plan is to look at what is the accidental manager? So try to define the term accidental manager in a bit more detail, along with some case studies that we've put together. Why does it happen? So why are there so many accidental managers and how do the situations arise? Um, then to look at what you can do. So as an employer um, or even as an individual, what, what can you do to address the potential shortfall that accidental managers may have as they move into first line management positions? So perhaps their first experience of people management or even into more senior roles where they're responsible for managing multiple teams. Um, ben and Caroline will be running through a support plan that you can put in place to help during the first six months of a manager's new role. And then we'd like to share some self-assessment ideas which can hopefully support you or your workforce to evaluate and prioritise workloads and responsibilities. And then finally, we'll end with a, a Q&A session um, and outline our next steps so the information we'll send out to you following the webinar. Now, with, with the um, Q&A session, please feel free to add any questions you may have um, or any that come to mind throughout the webinar into the chat as we run through. Um, I know we did provide the opportunity for people to ask questions ahead of today's session, um, and I think we've got a couple of these in already, which is fantastic. Um, Caroline, you're going to run us through these at the end and, and we'll hopefully provide some good responses and answers to those. Um, we'll obviously also answer as many as we can that have come into the chat time allowing. Um, if we can't answer all questions today, we will absolutely get back to people on an individual basis as part of our next steps. The webinar is planned for to run for 40 minutes, so hopefully um, we'll, we'll keep to time um, and we'll be able to get people away to enjoy the rest of their afternoons quite promptly afterwards. So firstly, introduction. So my name is Mark Ashton. I'm head of business development here at Cube Learning. I spent the last 15 years working in further education um, and around 18 years in total in various management roles at all levels, really. Uh, so started my management experience back in the army when I was first promoted at the age of 19. Um, and then I fell into management within the recruitment industry before finding my feet in further education, which, as I said, I've been in for the last 15 years. And that's both in multi-site college environments, but also in tr private training providers. Um, and I think looking back, I would absolutely suggest that many of my early management roles would put me in the bracket as an accidental manager. And whilst there's merit to learning on the job, I'm sure I could have avoided a few mistakes along the way 
with a bit more support and training um, as I kind of transitioned into those early roles. So I'll now pass to uh, Ben and Caroline to introduce themselves. So Ben, over to you first. Thanks, Mark. Yep, uh, so I'm Ben. I'm the Business Development Manager here at QVision. Um, I began my working days working in gyms, um, progressing up through the ranks through various positions up into management uh, before turning into the FE sector via an apprenticeship route. Um, I've worked in the apprenticeship sector now for over 20 years for both public and private organisations. Primarily, like I said, looking at management training, you know, your business services training, those type of subjects. Um, and again, through those years of, of experience, I've progressed up through into management and then management of trainers, um, developing their own apprenticeship provisions and so on. And again, I would I would say that initial experience in those gyms, in the in the fitness facilities, I was definitely an accidental manager, you know, being promoted within, not having that much support around me. Uh, especially around the management of people, having difficult conversations, which was all new, and definitely moving from that friend to a manager. You know, I, initially I was uh, that struggled me. You know, um, but as I became more knowledgeable of management through you know my other experiences, when I did progress again later on, I was a lot more prepared and a lot ready, uh, readier for that role. Um, so yeah, that's me, Caroline. Hello, I'm Caroline. I'm the Instructional Design Manager at Cube Vision. Um, my job basically is designing and developing immersive learning experiences. So it's, it's my um, courses and things that you'll be doing with everybody else. Um, I've got 20 years FE and HE experience um, teaching, managing curriculum. Um, I've also got 12 years worth of managing curriculum, managing um, people experience. And I've done that over five different roles. So I worked in FE colleges. Um, universities and in training provider sort of sector. Thanks. Over to you, Mark. Perfect. Thanks, Ben and Caroline. Um, so we'll move now to look at the, the first agenda item, which is what is an accidental manager? So um, according to the Chartered Management Institute, an accidental manager is someone who's been promoted because of their technical expertise and track record, but lacks the skills and experience in management. Um, and I think chiefly in its most simplistic term, this means, you know, talented individuals are promoted into management positions because they're outstanding in their role, something I think we can all recognise, know and, and understand. But crucially, they've been given little or inadequate support and training to become responsible for managing other people. And I think that's where we see the biggest shortfall is in the lack of people management skills. Um, and the CMI do go on to say that given the, the numbers involved, we should easily be able to recognise accidental managers and do something about it. Um, in reality, uh, although many employers are obviously aware of leadership and productivity problems surrounding accidental managers, I think it is hard to qualify the exact cost of poor management. So within organisations or a department, you might notice deadlines are missed, teams don't communicate or delegation is, is ineffective. And, and this is fundamentally a sign that the managers need assistance to become more able, more confident and essentially meet the demands of the, the job. Now, we, we've put together a few case studies to share. These are fictional people. However, the scenarios are, are kind of based on real life experiences and examples. Um, Ben's going to play these now. We'll, we'll turn off our cameras just so you can focus on the videos in our rehearsal. Um, these were a little bit quiet, so you may need just to turn your sound up slightly on your computer or your laptop um, just so you can hear them or you may find that using headphones will, will be an advantage. Sam works in customer service and has been with his company Global Care for 16 years. He worked his way up in the company from making the tea and giving out the post to leading the entire customer service team of 204 people. Sam was happiest at work when he was able to work with customers, manage a range of customer queries, lead a small team of experts and mentor staff to ensure they were the go-to team that everyone wanted to work with. Over time, Sam was given more and more responsibility as his senior managers could see how well he was doing and wanted to share that with the wider team. The company went through a major merger with one of its competitors and as the most knowledgeable and competent team leader, the new directors really wanted to keep Sam on. 
but this would mean he could only go for a senior manager role, taking him away from the chalk face, a meaning he could not continue to work with his small team, but would need to manage a number of centres in the UK. At first, Sam was excited to think that he would be able to nurture and support the whole customer services in the UK. He was also pleased to keep his job and get the recognition he wanted. But several of the team were not happy he was promoted while their friends were pushed out and the restructure made them very wary. They began not accepting any changes, failing to report on their targets, not meeting customer needs or turning up to meetings. They complained to HR about him and found any little thing to pick on. No one was in any doubt that performance was slipping, that Sam was not coping and he was distancing himself from everyone. Rebecca started to work for Global Care straight out of university, having read Human Resources and Management. The business belonged to her father, and she was given a managerial position in the HR team. Because of her education, both her and her father were certain that this would be the right role for her. And whilst there was a lot to learn about the company, the HR team were always nice, helpful and inclusive. Rebecca came into the company and decided the procedures, activities and roles needed to change. She spoke to her father and together they put into place a new organisational structure, going through job descriptions and reporting lines. This was then presented to the HR team, along with a list of procedures that needed to be altered and were being acted upon. Rebecca was not expecting the response she got. Her team walked out of the office, three went off sick, one marched straight in to see her father and the other to talk to her friend. All were upset and some were in tears. Rebecca felt very confused. She was only trying to help make things better for everyone. Tim was a real star for Global Care. He made record sales numbers each month. His clients loved him and all his colleagues really respected him, asking him for tips, tricks and advice all the time. Tim had seen a few of his colleagues promoted over him and he was happy with this as he wanted to keep making a difference at grassroots. But the time had come where Tim felt they had learnt and mentored others enough and when a job opportunity came up to run the department, he went for it. Naturally, Tim was amazing at interview and in presentations and got the job easily. Tim knew all the people interviewing him and he developed an excellent rapport already. He and they were really confident that this was a wonderful decision and that Tim would take the whole department to a new level. His manager expected Tim to hit the ground running and handed all the strategic targets, operational plans and staff reviews over to him so that he could get on with his job. Tim didn't even quite realise he would be expecting to do all these things with no support or explanation of what was needed. He went back to his office, shut himself away and tried to fathom what he was being asked to do. Perfect, thanks Ben. First technical hurdle overcome. So as I said, not, not real people, but um, pretty familiar examples. Um, you know, Rebecca, perhaps got it wrong, came straight from a theoretical perspective without the necessary practical experience. Um, Tim, perfect example, great at his job, wasn't supported and so couldn't hit the ground running. And then poor old Sam, victim of, um, sorry, victim of stepping into a more senior role, sort of following a merger and perhaps not quite being ready for that step up and, and also not quite getting his team on board with what he wanted to achieve. So I'm not sure if it's just me, but I felt elements of David Brent in the Office Series 2 with Sam's story there. So at, at this point, we'd love to get some feedback from everyone based on these case studies and, and obviously indeed your own experiences. Um, Luke is about to add our first poll of the webinar into the chat. Um, and what we'd like to do is, is just understand from all of you which of the following you believe is the biggest issue for an accidental manager. So, you know, is it fear? Um, is it poor communication, 
overacting, um, avoidance and lack of empathy, which I go, I think go together quite nicely, or is it wasting staff time and making mistakes? Now, unfortunately, you can only choose um, one answer. So we're, we're just looking for what you think is the biggest issue for an accidental manager. I'm sure the reality is all of the above um, are probably relevant to most cases, but just like the mask dancer, there has to be one winner. So I'll just give everyone a minute just to um, submit responses. OK, great. Looks like we've got some responses coming in at the moment. I'll just give it another another minute. OK, perfect. So it looks like we've got we've got a bit of a split there between kind of um, fear and, and poor communication at the moment. That will just stay up on your screen. Um, if you want to continue and submit votes um, in the next couple of minutes. And I think all resonate um, and obviously for me shows that often after the, the kind of initial enthusiasm and drive associated with a promotion settles down, lots of employees can find that rather than feeling like they've had a really kind of empowering step up, the becoming an accidental manager can leave them kind of feeling disenchanted as they struggle to you know, balance that that new role with often very overwhelming responsibilities. Um, but it is, it, you know, it's really good to kind of get a an understanding of what people on the webinar feel themselves. So moving on to the the why does it happen um, aspect, and I think we've covered this a little bit in trying to define the accidental manager. Uh, and I guess whilst accidental probably isn't a term that most employers would willingly choose to describe their staff, you know, many will be aware of accidental managers within their business and that they're increasingly common in the workplace. It, it is widely recognised that failing to address these issues can ultimately result in that kind of systemic underperformance. And just to give you some figures around this, according to the UK Government and Trades Union Congress, um, British workers have been on average 20% less productive than other nations over the last decade. Um, and that's with poor leadership broadly estimated to cost the UK economy £19 billion a year. So I think the question we all need to ask is why why do good staff get promoted or recruited? Because we're, we're not just talking about internal promotions as a single source of accidental managers. You know, two management roles without a clear structure or training plan in place to support them. And do, do businesses, for example, have a clear recruitment and onboarding process specifically for their managers? Are key skills and kind of an individual skills gap identified and addressed and then with a relevant training and development plan put in place as part of that recruitment process? So again, whether it's internal or external recruitment. And I think you often find that recruitment within organisations isn't always prioritised until it's urgent. So, for example, someone leaves, needs to be replaced, and then that process can be rushed to bring someone in as quickly as possible, rather than ensuring you bring in the right person for the right role, even if that takes longer. And, and having a huge emphasis on recruitment and onboarding, including for internal staff, will mean that you do get that right person for the right role. Start with start from day one with a clear understanding of their abilities, their current limitations and development requirements. Uh, and I think again, I, I'm probably posing questions which we we, we might seem quite obvious and, and ones that we all know the answer to. But I think we need these thought provoking conversations to just help us address how we do support new managers. So moving on then to the, the what can you do? So really the crux of the, the today's webinar. So as an employer, how how can you ensure that your managers, your managers, sorry, can maximise their skills, develop their management style and then ultimately inspire as a leader? So personal, professional development and training, perfect place to start and fundamental in supporting the transition into management. Um, and it's also crucial that this support is in place from day one of the transition or better still identified prior to the um, individual moving into the management position. So then they're supported and prepared for that change. So to give you an idea of what this could look like, I'm going to pass over to Ben and Caroline, who are going to run you through some ideas to help support managers during that crucial first six months in role. 
Thank you, Mark. So yeah, it's um, it's important to realise, as Mark, as Mark alluded to there, that it's not about, it happens even before the employee starts. You know, the idea behind an onboarding, it's not just about giving that new recruit an induction to their job, but it's also about getting them to feel part of the company, whether, you know, they're new to the company or whether they're progressing up through the company, elements of that relationship may change. You know, developing that sense of belonging from the moment the process starts. And again, even if the recruit is internally promoted, um, there should still be that very structured process in place to their probation. You know, the first 90 days after that job has been offered is the most critical to ensure that the needs of the new recruit are met. You know, it links back to Maslow, the, the hierarchy of needs. You know, that's a well-established model researching motivation and what motivates people. So the onboarding process is all about helping to create that motivating environment, create that, you know, a motivated employee um, so you need to be able to meet their needs, you know, to help ensure that they're a success in that role. So what can you do to create an onboarding process that is motivating, creates confident, well performing managers? Now, it all starts, like we mentioned, before they even start employment. So you've offered a job, it's been accepted, great. Now, whether the employee, again, has been recruited externally, or they're from an internal promotion, there is still that need to have a well-structured developmental induction. A pre-start phase where warm, you know, heat warm activities can be completed, this is an excellent transition from one role to another. However, there'll be a lot going on in that, in that employee, so it's very important not to overwhelm them. You know, start by giving them the option to participate or giving them simple activities that would be useful for them, such as, you know, system setups, um, equipment inductions, you know, job role reviews. So you have a sit down and you chat through, right, this is your new role, then this is how it differs from your current role. So they're aware and they're mentally prepared for what's going to happen from day one. Um, and then Caroline will follow on into day one. Right, so um, the first day started and whether the employee is a brand new employee or they're being promoted from within, they need the same fundamental three things. Um, the first is a plan for day one um, and they need to probably be sent this before they start. Um, the second is the location because they might already work for the company but they could be in a different building or with a different team um, and they need to know exactly where they're going to be, where they're going to be picked up from on day one. Um, and obviously for new recruits they really need to know where they're going. Um, who are they going to meet? So it could be like their line manager, um, it could be HR, um, it could be their team, um, it could be a critical friend if you want them to have one. Um, that information needs to be confirmed in an email and you may even want to put it into their calendars because you don't want to necessarily on the first day of the, of the new role have everybody piling into their calendar to try and meet them and get everything done. Um, so I would suggest that that's a, a really good thing to do. Um, you don't want to get somebody who's doing their current job and is suddenly thrust into their management job and they haven't been taken through these stages. Back to you then. Thank you. So they've had the first day and then you're looking into that initial week of that first role. You need to start to discuss in, you know, the key KPIs for that role. Um, they're going to be new to, their, to this person. Um, so a detailed session covering these targets and objectives is key for them to help understand, you know, their remits and what they're going to be targeted on. If it's an internal promotion, you're going from a member of staff to a team leader or a line manager, their KPIs will be very different and they should be handled differently. You know, it's one thing working towards a set of KPIs, but it's another thing managing people, working towards KPIs as well as having KPIs yourself. You know, so over the course of the first few weeks uh, in the role, it's important to have a clear plan for that new recruit. Ensure that the line manager is available, you know, spend time with them, go over roles and tasks, it helps the system understand their role uh, and you can observe them undertaking their tasks as they start to do them. You know, it allows that clear transition and then you're obviously there to help support as they go through. Also within this period, you know, a really good mentor support, you know, coaching structure is key. You know, having regular one to ones with their line manager, um, having a coach in place or a mentor uh, is a really good way to create that nurturing culture and will actually be able to help you monitor their performance, um, be able to support if any issues arise, answer any questions, you know, if they're struggling with anything or not, something's not working. You're there in that initial phase to really support and get 
you know, get them working how you would like them to work. Over to you, Caroline. So at three months, the honeymoon period is over. Um, so you might get somebody who's then starting to think, oh, why am I working here? I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. Um, that time is the time to take a breath, sit back and look at the performance so far, perhaps with that person, it's very good to do that, find out what they're doing, find out how they're feeling, um, what, what support, what barriers are they finding within their role, um, so you can help them with the issues that they might be coming across. It's a really good idea if you haven't already at this point to make sure that the person has a coach and a mentor and they've got the training plan sorted out for what they're going to be doing next. With a coach, it's advised that the coach isn't in the same team as them or their manager. This is because they may have issues that they don't want to really talk to people that they work with about, but also that coach could be someone that you phone up and say, right, I've got this meeting, this is going to happen, I'm not quite sure what to do. And they don't want to necessarily say that to their manager or to their direct report, so bear that in mind. Um, it's also really important that you reward exceptional work at this point keep them feeling really positive about themselves if you have an employee of the month program for example it might be a good idea to put them forward for that if they've done something exceptional that's outside of their normal job role back over to you ben thank you okay and so you're coming to the end of that six months you know the end of the line is in sight this is where you start to look at you know, either you know the annual review process or probation reviews, whichever you know fits into your timeline. If you followed a well structured review process, you know the, the performance of the new manager is going to have been closely monitored. Any issues hopefully would have been identified and worked through. So now it's that chance you know to have a positive meeting, give the official sign off for the probation, um, all, all being well, or you know if it hasn't gone so well, potentially extend that probation if required if that's still an option. But you also need to give the new manager a chance to raise any concerns, you know, go through how they thought it had gone from their point of view, because it's always a learning experience for yourself. You know, how how did they find the induction? Could it have been developed any better, you know, from their point of view? This pivotal experience is aimed at developing them further. In that initial six months, they might have excelled in what you've given them to do, in which case potentially you could, you know, highlight them for talent management going forward to, to progress even further. They may have found out the needed training in a specific topic or a specific area. And this appraisal process or probation review is a perfect opportunity to put plans in motion. Um, obviously agreed between both parties, so everybody's happy, but it's a really good idea to then set that plan going forward over the next couple of months, even years. If this really strong, well-structured process is followed within this initial six month period, hopefully you'll find that the new manager should be confident, comfortable, they know what they're doing, they know the support is there, and those feelings of the accidental manager, you know, they shouldn't be in this role, they don't know what they're doing, they can't cope, um, fear, panic, you know, hopefully those types of things won't raise their heads. Okay, Mark. Excellent, thank you, Ben and Caroline. So hopefully some really, really useful information from everyone there and, a, you know, a real answer to the what can you do question. Um, so we're, we're now going to ask you again for your opinions in our second poll, uh, which is around the support Ben and Caroline have just identified. Again, only one answer. To, so looking at the below options, what, what is the most important support method for a new manager, in your opinion, in the first six months of their role? So is it the critical friend? Is it coaching? Is it mentoring? Or is it those regular meetings with their manager? Um, so Luke's just added that poll in. So again, I'll just give everyone just a minute or two um, just to have a think and submit which they think is the, the 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 most important to them. There's no right or wrong answer here, I can assure you, and no one's going to be marking this. OK, great. So yeah, regular meetings with, with the manager is coming out on, on top at the moment. But uh, they've all, you know, apart from mentoring at the minute, which is probably just as important, they've all got a vote. So, you know, uh, that's probably the highest, but a bit of a split across there. And I guess we're being a bit mean by only allowing you to select one answer. But it is it is interesting to see different opinions that um, that might come in. And I, I think for me, the key is really the the understanding the importance of all of the aspects that Caroline and Ben have, have just been through and having the mindset to flex 
based on an individual's needs. So, you know, what might be the most important to one of your managers might be different to another. So you wouldn't you wouldn't expect your managers to manage their team in exactly the same way. You'd want them to get the best out of each individual by understanding what motivates them and managing our managers shouldn't be any different. And I think the key other thing is tr don't try and do everything at once, you know, understand the priority, make make that your focus and then introduce other aspects of their training plan as and when appropriate. So self-assessment. So we're just going to have a quick look at self-assessment now. I mean, self-assessment is obviously crucial throughout that process. It's not just about what you can do to support your managers. It's also, you know, what can they do to support themselves? Um, this is one resource we're going to share as part of the next steps is our self-assessment tool, which Caroline's team have put together. So Caroline's going to run you through uh, this tool and how you can use it. But first of all, we've got a short video just to help illustrate the self-assessment resource. Right, thank you for that. Um, this coaching technique um, has, is a really great way of supporting performance management um, and can affect real change. You're going to have um, a card sort to download, print out, chop up, um, and the same instructions that you just saw in that video are on the front card. The idea of the self-assessment is something that evolves and is a lifelong learning experience really within any role, within a company or um, personal. Um, this helps a person to set realistic, hopefully, smart targets, um, objectives, key results, leading towards the team's um, key performance indicators. Um, the idea behind this is to basically have sm a small set of targets rather than do everything at once. You're working on things as you go along that are totally relevant to your job right now, rather than a job in, in six months time, for example. Um, so hopefully um, that's something you could potentially use. Um, I know that it's been really useful for me when I've done stuff. Um, and I, I hope that you find it useful too. Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, we really hope it's a useful tool. And um, as mentioned, uh, you know, we'll include a copy of this in our in our next steps email. So so that that, that brings us to the end of the, the presentation uh, part of the webinar. Um, as we said, we'll, we'll send out a copy of the presentation and all of the resources to you as a follow up and we'll we'll move now into um, the Q&A section. So uh, we'll, we'll pass to Luke in a minute and see if anyone has added any questions or if this is your opportunity, I guess, to have a think and add any questions into the chat that you would like to. Um, Caroline, I know we've had a couple or a few in ahead of today's session, so three. <laughs> Great. So I'll let you I'll let you read those and then hopefully we can um, we can provide a response between us. OK, brilliant. Right, so the first question we've had, um, I promoted one of my staff to a management role, but it seems that they were not ready for it. What should I do? OK, to answer yeah. that. <laughs> great question. Good one to start. Um, I've spoken lots today, so I'll, I'll give everyone a break for my voice. And Ben, are you yep. happy to take some up? Yep. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll have, a, I'll have a go. So. Um, a great question, actually, and I think that situation where you've promoted somebody and now you're kind of questioning your decision, I think that's a really common situation that people find themselves in. Um, what I would want to try and do is firstly understand or get to know what you've put in place already for that new member of staff. You know, you've promoted them within. 
what's already in place, what support have they had, what training have they had, you know, how, how, did they have a plan like we we have mentioned earlier, or has it just been here's your new role, off you go kind of thing. Also, you'd want to look at why you feel that way, you know, what is it about the performance that you feel is wrong? Um, are they not hitting targets? Are they not performing? Are they shying away from the, the key decisions of being a manager? You know, what what is it that, that you that's sitting in your gut that's thinking it's the wrong decision? You know, once you've got those kind of bits of information, you can then sit down with that person and um, have that honest, open conversation, you know, work through any key points that either of you raise. You know, it's it's that open forum, I think, that's, which is key. It's not you telling them. It's it's that two way dialogue. Um, come up with a plan. You know, this is why I think this is why I think and then work together to come up with that negotiated plan going forward. And that plan could be obviously, you know, further training. It could be online learning. It could be shadowing, you know, having a mentor put in place or a coach if it wasn't there already. Maybe it might be one of those instances where you have to extend that probation. You know, if you're in that situation, if it's gone past that, then obviously the other route around performance management would come into it. You know, you might have regular weekly meetings or monthly meetings, obviously, depending on the situation, just to monitor that plan that you've implemented to see if it's working. Uh, fingers crossed, you know, if you put the right things in place, then hopefully that situation should resolve itself. Ultimately, you know, if it, if it doesn't, then obviously the, the performance management route maybe need to be followed on till its end. Hopefully that answers the question. I think it does, but yeah, great. Thanks, Thank um, Right, I'm not sure if you're going to want me to answer this, but tell me. Um, I'm not sure what transition support has been offered. Sorry, I'll start again. I'm not sure what transition support has been offered to staff in your organisation. Um, what would be the main thing you would suggest? Oh, I think you volunteered to answer that one, Caroline, already, so yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. OK, well, we're really lucky at you. Um, our HR team have got a really good like training plan. So um, for the first month, the manager, before the person starts, has to kind of annotate exactly what the person is going to be doing. Probably they're encouraged to put it into their calendar as well. Um, so they book all the appointments with people and they introduce them, which is fantastic. Um, the plan's quite agile, um, and I would suggest that you need a sort of agile training plan because things change. Um, different people might need them to do slightly different jobs um, at the time. I think it's probably good um, also to put into place a critical friend. I really think that's a really good idea because otherwise they can feel really lonely. And I know that we work remotely quite often and it can get to be, if you're not careful, really lonely. So I think that training plan's um, really important. So I suppose in a nutshell, what I'm saying is um, you should really put training plan into place for the person and make sure that they're planned for what they're doing and set targets, maybe do a bit of training, but don't overwhelm them. Does that make sense? I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's very good. Thanks, Caroline. Right, the third question, Mark, you might want to take this, I don't know. Um, my company have been through a merger and there is a team restructure coming. What can I do to support my managers? Okay, um, so yeah, I guess as soon as I handed the other two over, I probably should pick this one up. So um, yeah, I've been through uh, a few restructures previously, not not mergers, um, I would add, but the, the process will probably be similar. So again, really, Really good question, not an easy one to answer if I'm honest. Um, you know, mergers, restructures, always really delicate situations, lots of emotion involved for everyone effective. Um, obviously, there'll be some disappointment for some and often guilt for others who are successful where, you know, their once colleagues weren't. Um, I, I think the key for me is to be as transparent as possible throughout the process with, you know, with your managers, and then that will allow them in turn to be as transparent as possible with their teams. I know again from experience transparency is difficult within a within a restructure because sensitive information isn't always released to everyone at the same time and managers may be privy to information for you know before others but understanding I guess um, everyone's viewpoint to seeing things from the other side is, uh, and recognizing that not everyone will react in the same way is probably quite crucial Flexibility will be the key to so allowing people to process things in in their own way, in their own time. Um, and I, I think one, you know, one decision in the restructure process might be a single decision in, in the management from a management perspective. It could also be the single, single biggest decision for an individual. So it might mean job or no job. So, 
you know, be, being really responsive and supportive to your managers, again, will allow them to do the same. Um, it will almost give them that critical friend, I guess, and, and to kind of know that support is there. And then <laughs> dovetailed with that, making sure productivity doesn't suffer throughout the process is, is, is obviously up there. People will react differently, so some will become more productive, some will say the same. Um, and some could be, could become very demotivated by the whole process. So again, I think you know, say, I'm kind of repeating myself a bit, but but making sure your managers know how to manage, know that they feel supported, means that they can then support their team in turn. Um, and if that's if that's not a good enough answer, if any of them haven't quite um, answered, uh, we'll we'll make sure we kind of identify who asked those questions, and we can follow up with with people individually. Um, OK, so uh, that, that kind of comes to in this, in fact, no, sorry, that is handing over to Luke just to say I was looking at the chat, Luke. I don't know if there's any other questions that have been added into the chat that I haven't seen. Um, no, nope, looks like you've um, you've answered everything perfectly. We've uh, had no questions. Fantastic. Well, again, if people do have, um, you know, questions, we'll, we'll be sending out follow up details. So please respond to that and, and ask any further questions you, you would like to. Um, again, I hope everyone has found the webinar useful and informative. Um, uh, thank you to Ben, to Caroline um, as my co-host and Luke for technical support behind the scenes. Uh, we hope everyone has a lovely rest of the afternoon and we will leave you to enjoy it. Thank you.